Hello, friends. Welcome. Today, I want to dive deep into an understanding of the practice of mindfulness and its power to change your mind, to change your perception and to change how you respond to the world. To be mindful is to develop self-awareness and essentially to integrate and coordinate your personality as an effective vehicle for soul expression. I will explore the psychology and the science as well as the deeper esoteric insights behind this ancient spiritual practice that's founded in Buddhism, but it's now adopted by many Western progressive minds, sometimes unappreciated and dismissed as um, simply a new age practice. But that's by those who don't truly understand its power and its power to raise your conscious awareness so that you connect with that which is universal. It's essentially to view the world as a soul. So it sounds simple, and mindfulness can evoke a profoundly beautiful experience of life, but it's not easy to cultivate, especially in our Western society. It requires discipline over an extended time to master, and I aim to show you just what mindfulness is, what it is not, and how it goes hand in hand with the practice of meditation as essential to anyone who seeks to truly live and not just simply study or know about a spiritual life. So many find it challenging as it asks you to be prepared to take off the lenses that you wear that color the way you see the world and to see the world as it truly is. So let's begin. So you could swap the word mindfulness for consciously aware, greater awareness, soul connection, connection to universal consciousness, uni unity consciousness, soul consciousness, soul perception, to existing in a higher vibrational state, truth perception, intuitive living. These are all mindfulness. When you are mindful, you step into a connection with the eternal now, that's ever, that ever-present awareness, and you step out of the thinking of your lower mind as an interpreter of reality. You become the silent witness, the observer, and simply connect with the world through your senses and allow it to be as it is. This is living as a soul experiencing the material world. In present moment awareness, there's no mind thought, no commentary, no analysis, no opinion, no judgment, or any other thought process coloring your experience. You remove the lens that colors your perception and simply experience things as they are. And this brings deep insights and truths. Through mindfulness, we come to realize the illusion of time and understand the continuity of consciousness. Time is a construct of the lower mind, and it is in these moments of timelessness that you can appreciate that the present moment is all you ever have. The past is gone. The future will never arrive. But here and now, you have the opportunity to change. In fact, it's the only time you can change. It is also the only moment you can truly experience what it is to be alive. All creativity, all happiness, all choice only resides in the present moment. So in the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, the popular Buddhist monk who um, has done much to progress our understanding and insights into mindfulness. He says, the present moment is the only time over which we have dominion. Many people are alive, but don't touch the miracle of being alive. And we're seeing this more in a society where reality, through the lens of our perception, is harder and harder to face. We see young people increasingly distracted by technology, 
We see people choosing ways to be distracted from their challenges, from things they cannot handle, whether they're addicted to shopping or alcohol or being busy, whatever it is. We're a society, especially in the West, that's really avoids mindfulness at all cost. We're almost frightened of what it might reveal. And I want to take away the fear. I want to take away that need to be distracted from what's before you. Because when you open up to what's before you, it is truly a miracle. Life becomes magical again. Like it was when you were a child. Children are naturally mindful and connected. Very wise man here. When asked what surprised him most about humanity, man sacrifices his health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices his money to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die and then dies having never really lived. Like I said, a very wise man. We often experience the wonder of mindfulness in moments of crisis or trauma. And this is when we act spontaneously, intuitively as the need arises, with no thought or planning, and these actions often reflect the highest human capacities and qualities. We all know incredible stories of true heroes who simply responded to the need of the moment. Many accidents occur when we are not mindful. Okay. We see mindfulness in the seemingly effortless, incredibly beautiful, almost slow motion action in sports people who have mastered mindfulness and performance and allow the performance to come through them as an expression of who they are. You may have experienced moments of absolutely clear insight when intuitive understanding simply arises on the palate of your mind and paints a beautiful picture of complete realization of some truth or presents the perfect solution to a problem or a conflict. This can only occur if you are present and aware, not caught up in your thinking mind. I know myself, if I am seeking a solution to a problem, instead of sitting there trying to work it out, I go for a walk. I go for a walk in the woods and I just connect with nature and I connect with my environment. And before that walk's over, half an hour at the most, the most amazing solution or creative idea to the problem will have just popped into my lovely, clear mind. And this is, this is how our mind, this is the power of our mind when we can, we can just connect and be. In the West, especially, we've developed our lower analytical thinking mind through education and the accumulation of knowledge. And this was a necessary part of our collective evolution. But increasingly, there is a realization that we've overdeveloped our mind in this way. Many of the mental ailments and anguish that are on the increase, and especially the West, are due to overthinking and an over-reliance on the lower mind. We are too much in our head. Unfortunately, with our technology, this is likely to increase. In her book, Intellect to Intuition, Alice Bailey goes into this in quite some detail. She speaks of the more mystical path through the love of God to enlightenment and the occult path through the understanding of God through the mind. However, there is the need for the occultist to move beyond the knowledge of the mind and open to the intuitive, which comes directly from the higher self. And she speaks of the need for the development of the intuitive knower. We only open to new thoughts, inspirations, illuminations when we surrender our usual thought processes and open to the language of the higher self, the soul, which is the intuition. 
This intuitive knowing comes through in the space created in your mind when you are simply mindful and aware. Einstein recognized this. He said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind a faithful servant. He said all great achievements of science must start from intuitional knowledge. And he once told a friend, at times I feel certain I am right while not knowing the reason. And that's, that's where it starts. Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita had to learn to be in the moment, to be present, and do, to do what was required of him in that moment, guided by his higher self, Krishna. When he switched off the conflicting thoughts in his mind, the analysis, the, his astral nature, his attachment, his thoughts, he opened to a full realization of Brahma, of God, and understood all of creation and witnessed the beauty and power of all that is. The drama of the battle melted away into the illusion that it is. There is a time for focused study and reading occult classics and ancient wisdom teachings through the use of the higher mind, especially when this is done mindfully. But life is your greatest spiritual teacher and here to be experienced, for you to be present. This is why we are here in this school of souls. It is our role to spiritualize matter. We have to be present and connected to matter to do so, to use our consciousness, our spiritual awareness, to observe life in all its myriad of colors, to be open to the intuitive understanding that flows when our awareness is wholly present, wholly present in this moment. Spending time in nature is an excellent way to practice mindfulness. In fact, it's where I suggest you begin. When we simply allow ourselves to be in nature, to open all of our senses and breathe, we experience ourselves as a soul. That's why we feel so expansive. We feel, ah, oh, I can breathe. And if you see people's energy fields, you see them expand out in ever-increasing waves of energy as they just almost shake off the confines of having been held back and they just allow themselves to be, to connect with that which is universal. We experience this profound connection and we feel grounded. We're reminded that we are part of all that we see and experience in life. This connection to the peace inherent in nature, enables a connection to the peace inherent within us. An outer love of the peace in nature inspires an inner love of meditation and a connection to seek this peace, to seek a deep source of wisdom, clarity, calm, and the strength within you. To be mindful is to function as a soul through your personality vehicle. You see the world, hear the world, connect with the world through your physical senses and your etheric energy is one entity. There is no duality, no conflict, analysis, commentary, or any of the emotional, astral, lower mind stuff of the personality. You just are. When mindful, you spiritualize matter. You bring your soul to witness the dance of life. A focus on your breath, as we found this morning in yoga, will always bring you into the present moment. This is the role of the breath. It is the great connector. It coordinates and integrates in that moment all aspects of you into one whole. It connects you with your higher self. This is why in profound moments of connection, we often experience our breath is taken away as we pause and feel this connection. We experience the breathtaking awareness when we connect with a sunset, a sunrise, a poignant moment in the day when all mind activity is quiet and you simply are. You learn to be, to be present. 
This is a connection in that moment with the truth of who you are. It is your soul seeing the world, hearing the world, feeling the world. And that is why in these moments we see incredible truth, beauty and goodness. We see ourselves in that moment. We experience ourselves and the world as one. So when you see that sunset and it takes your breath away, sorry, you're seeing yourself. The qualities of the soul seeing the truth of the world with no duality. You and the world are one and you're open to an awareness of all that is going on in the world, a profound awareness. You'll find your hearing, you can hear insects and crickets. You can see the aura around flowers. You open to an awareness where, you know, as we, as we evolve, we will all evolve etheric vision. We've got to see the world first before we can even think of seeing it etherically. This, is, this was what you experienced when we come out of meditation. When I take people for meditation, just before they open their eyes, in fact, try this. Just close your eyes for a minute. And just focus on your breath. Just gently watching the rhythm. Until you feel your whole being calming down. And just keep this gentle focus on the breath and it will take you down into that inner stillness. And once you feel that your whole being has calmed and you have connected to that inner peace, I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes closed for a moment because you're going to come out of this moment in a different way. So I want your intention to be that as you open your eyes, in that moment, I want you to see, hear and experience all that's before you. So when you're ready, just gently open your eyes and just observe. Can you feel the presence of the connection in this room? Because I can. In that moment when you first open your eyes, before the first thoughts come into your mind, in that moment you are mindful, aware, present. And if you practice this when you come out of your meditation, you'll start to see the true beauty of the world. You will be overwhelmed by the beauty of the world, especially if you say like to practice meditation outside. And you're sitting under a tree and you open your eyes and oh my goodness, the beauty of the world will take your breath away. Um, try it, okay? So you can experience incredible insights into everything as mindfulness opens your intuition because you're connecting to that which is universal. Universal consciousness, universal mind, the eternal now is to be connected. Love, which is the energy vibration of our universe, is connection. So that's what love is. Love is connection. Fear and all its manifestations, manifestations is simply an absence of love. Fear is based on disconnection. So whenever you feel fear, doubt, anger, jealousy, any of the, the shame, guilt, the negative emotions, it's just, a, it's just information. You are disconnected in some way. And it's a disconnection from your soul, from love, from God, from the universe. They're actually all one. And of course, in miracles, we are taught that you can only ever be in a state of love or a state of fear. The two cannot coexist. 
Fear is generated in the mind and doesn't actually exist. It's an illusion. We don't experience it as an illusion in the last couple of years. We know it feels very real. But it's one of the glamours that mankind has to transmute. It's very much about transmuting from the solar plexus up to the heart, which I'll talk more about tomorrow. In fact, it is one of the nine heads of the hydra we face in Scorpio, and we are seeing that playing out in the world today. Fear is used to control minds. Fear is generated of the mind and can be used to control minds. Love is not a sentimental feeling. Love is not really what our culture portrays love to be. It's not a Valentine's Day thing at all. Because that involves sentiment and attachment. Love doesn't have sentiment or attachment. And that's an attachment to that which is loved or loving. It's far more than the emotion that we understand it to be. Love is a state of being. Love is a state of connection. So when you are mindful, you are in a state of love. It's not till after about the third initiation I've read that we truly understand what love is. We don't really understand love. We're we're getting there. We sort of have a glimpse of what unconditional love is, but we don't really understand this concept of being love. It seems to be an emotion that, that goes through our solar plexus, and that is lower chakra love, the higher love. Um is a total immersion and union with that which is loved. This comes from the externalization of the hierarchy. So love is a total connection. What it is to be filled with the Christ consciousness, and this is to be connected completely, unconditionally, because you exist, to be able to love all others, regardless whether you know them or not, regardless of their personality, to love their soul, to love as a soul, to recognize that connection between you and them, and there is no, there is no disconnection, there is no duality. When you're present in the moment, for that brief time, you experience love and a connection to the universal, and that which stands behind all of creation. By connecting to creation, you connect to the creator, to God, to Brahman, to the universal field of consciousness, or whatever way you define the intelligence or energy that interweaves and connects all. Alice Bailey wrote, The mind is the slayer of the real. In her book, Intellect to Intuition, she explores this idea we've developed, overdeveloped our concrete mind to the detriment of the development of our higher intuitional capabilities. And many people are starting to recognize this. Um, Even in the last five years, I would say there's been a shift in this understanding of what's essentially esoteric psychology. People are starting to recognize that much of the mental disquiet in the world, and it's of epidemic proportions that's causing the anxiety, the panic, the depression. An increase in mental health problems is due to overthinking. This you come to know through a practice of mindfulness that quietens your mind. People seek peace, clarity of mind and purpose, creative expression of ideas and ideals. And these all need space in your mind. Mindfulness creates that space. Observe the painter completely absorbed in creating the painting with little or no thought. The composer who seems to simply open up as a channel for the creation of a beautiful symphony. Witness the healing power of gardening when you're just totally gardening. You know no time. You know no concept of how much time has gone past. You're just gardening totally immersed, you in the garden. We go into nature when we need to heal our mind, but we don't realize that we can do this anytime, anywhere. Tonight, I'm going to give you an example of something called active listening. Mindful listening to music is healing. When you simply listen to music as the silent witness 
without thought. It's profoundly beautiful. The music plays not just through your ears, through your whole being. Active listening to another person, to another, is when you listen to understand. When we listen to understand, we listen as a soul. When we listen to reply, we listen as a personality with an ego and attachment to our ideas and ideals. Do you see the difference? Have you ever just listened to a child with a mind that's simply listening to the child? Have you seen the way they light up when you do this? Because it's like you're seeing their soul and they will then open their soul and show you their beauty. Try it. Try just listening to understand, totally absorbed in listening to that person's truth. And you'll be amazed. As a single mum of four children, I learned that when you truly listen, you actively listen to your children, they don't require that much of your attention. It's like love and, attent and actively listening is what they require. And because of the quality of that listening, they don't need hours of your attention. And that's how you manage four. <laughs> and when you do this, it allows you to see and witness the soul of another. There's no greater gift than someone witnessing you as you are as a soul. I see you. And it's imperative in resolving conflict and building right relations. This is where we're going with right relations. We need to learn to listen. It's about the throat chakra is not just about, uh, you know, not just about um, learning to speak and speak up and speak your truth. The throat chakra is about learning to listen. And many, many in the world who are developing the centers, opening the centers above the diaphragm, many are opening the heart. Some are moving on to open the throat. It is the harmony aspect of the fourth ray of harmony through conflict an energy that is involved in the evolution of the whole human kingdom and the development of greater conscious awareness. You become more aware when you're mindful, you become more aware of people. It becomes easier to sense that which is not said. It's not just reading body language. You become, you, you become able to read or know their soul, their etheric body. You just get a sense of um, who they are and what's going on for them. It's almost like a, a hyper-empathetic um, awareness of people. I've found you can tune in and listen and become aware of that which stands behind all sound in the world through active listening, through mindful listening. I call this the sound of silence. The silence from where all sound arises and to which all sound returns. To do this, you have to be the silent witness, to connect as a soul and be mindful and aware. So what I want to do now is explore a little bit of the latest scientific and psychological understandings of our mind, because uh, this will help you to understand mindfulness from a more scientific point of view. So this is a simplified version of what's called the thought feeling loop. So the idea is that we have um, thoughts in our mind and these produce neuropeptides, chemicals, that create feelings in our body. And we think of feelings as being in our mind, but actually feelings are in our body. And then the feelings in our body feed back to the mind with different chemical messengers. And this is why if you have a particular thought, say I think, um, say I have a fearful thought, say I had a fear of standing up and talking in front of people. I don't, luckily, but say I did. Oh, God, I've got to go up and give that talk. I've got to go and stand up in front of people. That thought sends all these chemicals to my body that starts to go into the stress response. My stomach goes into a knot, I start sweating, my breathing's up here, I've got knots of tension in here, I'm tensing up because this is a scary thing for me. I've had that thought. And then my body, all these changes in my body is sending messages back up to my brain saying, getting really stressed here, okay? And the brain 
the mind then creates more thoughts. Yeah, that yeah. Well, last time you got up and talked, look what happened. And and you know, <laughs> and what happens is we wind up going round this loop. Oh yeah, last time I got up and talked, it was awful, and no one listened, and they seemed to be falling asleep, and I felt so nervous, and I jumbled my words, and then your body getting more worked up, you're going right into the stress response now, and it's going round and round until do do do, you're in overload, you're in panic, you're in anxiety, and you're in meltdown. And if you do this often enough, you get personality traits. You get habitual grooves in your um, in your brain. You wire in patterns and habits of thinking and feeling that become your thing. They become your personality. People recognise them as how you are, and it's because you've gone round and round this loop so many times. So the latest research um, says we have, oh, well, I don't know, six, 7,000 thoughts a day running through our mind. Many of these are the same thoughts we had yesterday, and most of them are not originally yours. Have you ever noticed in your mind how many other people are speaking in there? Oh, that's what my mother used to say. Oh, that's, oh, oh, oh. that's come from the news. Oh, that's come from... If you start observing your mind, you'll go crazy at first, but it'll be a good informative thing to do because you'll realize there's not much original stuff going on in there. Okay. If you've ever observed your thought, you'll see there are patterns and tendencies and deeply grooved trains of thought we habitually follow. The Buddhists call these thoughts the chattering of the monkey mind. Okay, a couple of things I want to go through before I go on to the next slide that will just help. So mindfulness is to be in the present moment. Fear and doubt are always based on the past. They're what happened. The fear and doubt that you feel, that you think, is always something from the past. Because in this moment, this is a fresh moment, anything can happen. What happened in the past has no relevance to what's happening right now. Worry and anxiety are just past fear and doubt that we project into the future, but are experienced now. So fear and doubt are in the past. Worry and anxiety are projecting that fear and doubt into the future. And stress, we know, when I talk about stress, we, it's a response to a threat. And usually we either want to run, flight, fight, or freeze. Those are the three most common fear um, responses to stress. Now that stress response can be triggered by internally or externally generated perceived threats. So if there's a tiger coming towards you, okay, that's going to set off the stress response. That's an external, not just a perceived threat, but probably a more real threat. Okay, that's why we have the stress response, so that I can run or climb a tree or freeze or whatever I need to do to preserve my survival. But thoughts about the tiger also create the stress response. Thinking, well, last time that tiger this happened, projecting it into the future, well, what if a tiger comes next time what if a tiger comes and worries me in my tent or going through all that worry what if what if what if they create the same stress and this is why we have stress and epidemic proportions in our society and the illnesses associated so that thought feeling loop that I've just explained to you leads to habitual ways of responding to life, like I said, to personality traits. And these patterns arise from our unconscious mind when we are not present and aware. I'll say that again because that's really important. When I am present in the moment, I am not driven by my unconscious mind. I am consciously here, aware responding to life. Whenever I am not present, i.e. when I'm thinking, I respond to life from the patterns, conditionings, beliefs, ideals stored in your unconscious mind. 
and this is really important. I'll give you an example. Have you ever done a journey in your car and you get there and you realise you can't remember any of the journey because you did it with an unconscious program in your mind? You've done so much driving, you've probably done that journey loads of times before that you didn't need your conscious mind to do that journey. But if suddenly a car stopped in front of you or someone pulled out, suddenly you're jolted back into conscious reality and your conscious mind takes over because the unconscious program can't respond to what's going on in the here and now. Have you experienced that kind of jolt? Oh, right, okay, I'm here. Hopefully you get the brakes on in time. Um, we can heal and change the conditioned programs, beliefs and habits of our unconscious mind by being consciously aware of them. Because once we're consciously aware of them, they're no longer unconscious, and I'll show you. So what mindfulness does is it interrupts that thought-feeling loop because you become conscious of what's going on internally. How You become conscious, you observe your own thought pattern. You observe how you're responding to the world. Uh, I just want to go to this one. Okay, so you can think of your mind as like an iceberg. So the conscious mind in most people, this is people who are perhaps not so consciously aware or haven't actively developed their consciousness, makes up about 5% of our mind. So it's like the little bit of the iceberg you can see at the top. The unconscious mind makes up about 95% of our mind and governs most of our behavior. Any reactive behavior, any habitual behavior, uh, always comes from the unconscious mind. And this is where our beliefs, our values, our conditionings, and any emotional traumas from this life and others can be stored. This is where all other people's, all the information that you were given by other people is stored. And the thing is about the unconscious mind is most of those programs were laid down between the ages of zero and seven. You know the quote, um, give me the child of seven and I'll give you the man. And this is because from zero to seven is when we're really finding out how to survive in our family, in life, in the world. And so depending what situation we grow up in and what experiences we have, in that time, we will lay down beliefs and conditionings and values and ways of coping and managing in the world. But unfortunately, when we get to be grown adults, we're still being driven by the zero to seven year old unconscious mind. This is when we're not present. When we're thinking, when we're doing something and thinking and not present, we're, we're ruled by the unconscious mind. And this is why we get so annoyed with people we're, say, relating to. Um, we're sort of confused. Sometimes they're conscious and they'll behave in quite um, a respectful way or quite an evolved way. And other times they seem to revert back to being like a child. And you're like, what's going on with this person? And you're recognizing they're not present in that moment. And so they're being ruled by their unconscious mind. Um, so you can think of our mind as like a computer. So your brain is like the hardware. The programs we need to navigate life are stored on the hard drive. The unconscious programming happened before the age of seven. Many of those unconscious beliefs are self-sabotaging, disempowering, and contain limiting beliefs. Not always, if you had a really positive upbringing, but you've got to also remember it's how a child zero to seven interprets the world. And they don't always know all the black and white and gray and nuances. Um, they see things very black and white and they might misinterpret what's going on. They don't know all the considerations adults are making in their choices and their behaviors. They just see things as they do. So your, your conscious mind is present, mindful and aware, focused and able to tap into universal consciousness beyond just our mind. 
So there's a wisdom far beyond all those limited beliefs, those self-sabotaging beliefs. There's some really good stuff in your unconscious mind. Don't, get, don't think it's all negative. It's not. Um, when you are conscious, there are fewer thoughts, almost no thought, or only the thoughts that are required to respond consciously to the world at that moment. And there's space for creative thinking, what I call proper thinking, where you're actually using your mind as a tool to think. And this is perhaps something that only comes after quite a few years of meditation where the mind just becomes a quiet place and you can choose to use your mind to think. So you are thinking, not your mind thinking you, if that makes sense. So a practice of mindfulness keeps us conscious, using our conscious mind more of the time. Every time you decide to be present, every time you decide to be mindful, you are choosing to be conscious. And the thing that really builds this is a practice of meditation. And I'm going to explain how meditation is. Um, you could think of meditation as training your mind daily and mindfulness as moment-by-moment moment spiritual practice, living, breathing spiritually. And it will affect how you look, and how you look at life is how you will see life. So if you're looking at life through the lens of your thoughts and your unconscious mind, you're going to see it depending on those experiences that you had zero to seven. One person will see it one way and another person will see it another way. And then they'll argue about what they're seeing. They're saying, no, this is reality. No, that's reality. And it's like, ah, no, that's reality. When you, when you put down the thoughts, the conditionings. So to be mindful is to shine the light of the conscious mind down to what's buried underneath the iceberg, that which is hidden and unconscious, so that you become aware of it. Once you see your patterns, once you see your responses, once you own them, you're halfway to healing them. Once you see the emotional traumas that, that created the responses that are habitually yours, you're halfway to um, to healing them. You see unresolved issues, patterns, beliefs. If you've got some issue that turns up in every relationship you ever have, that's a mirror going, have a look in your unconscious mind. Okay? Other people are mirrors. They show us what's in our unconscious mind. Our relationships show us what needs healing. Whenever you are angry, that is information, something needs healing, something's unresolved, something's been triggered in your unconscious mind. You can take back, and, and, and what happens is when you're ruled by the unconscious mind, you feel like you're not in control of your mind, but you can take back that power, okay? You can take back your power and choose how to respond in the moment consciously. You can choose whether to react to that comment someone made, or you can choose to let it go. You can choose to respond differently when you are doing so consciously and mindfully. And this ultimately increases your self-awareness. Man, know thyself. That's what we're here to do. This changes your behavior. This is developing right toward right action, right intention, um, right relations. Um, whoops. I don't want to do this. Okay, how does meditation develop mindfulness? So when people meditate, it rewires neural pathways in the brain. Brains of people who meditate tend to be what they call more plastic, more adaptable and flexible, not so hardwired as you get older, not so stuck in habitual thinking. Meditation improves your concentration, your focus, your memory, your learning, your creativity, problem solving, and opens you up and develops the capacity to listen to your intuition. So in meditation, we are the observer, the watcher, and this cultivates certain qualities that really, uh, certain qualities of mindfulness. So when we are the observer in meditation, we are cultivating a mindfulness quality of acceptance. Um, in meditation, we're accepting thoughts as they are. We are quite often stepping back from them, observing them, letting them pass through our mind, but we're just letting them be. 
There's an active recognition that things are as they are. And this acceptance, this daily practice of acceptance tends to then um, flow into your life so you become better able to accept life as it is, to accept other people as they are, to um, see things differently. There's also intention. So in meditation we always have a focus, whether it's the breath, whether we're working with a mantra, whether we're working with a seed thought, whether we're working with a candle, um, whatever we keep coming back to. So what we're getting our lower mind to focus on in meditation, there's an intention to return to the breath. Every time your mind wanders off, there's an intention to return. And this cultivates that ability to be mindful. You return again and again and again until it becomes easy. I remember reading something um, written by the Dalai Lama who meditates five hours every day. And he said, yeah, my mind still wanders. But, you know, because of who I am, I've got to bring it back pretty quick. Um, He was quite open about it. And he said, you know, I've been doing it so long, it just comes back. It doesn't wander for long. I recognize my mind's wandered. Bring it back. So even the most cultivated meditators, their mind will still wander. They just recognize it sooner and they bring it back more easily. There's a feeling of surrender. There's a surrender in meditation. You've got to surrender your thinking mind. You surrender your lower mind, letting go and letting be. So you can step back and simply observe thoughts and feelings as they arise in that moment. You're not trying to be mindful, but allowing yourself to be. And this idea of surrender is a really, I was talking about this today in yoga. It's a really hard one for the West. We're not very good at surrender. We'd rather be doing, set me a goal and I'll strive. But surrender, how do I do that? How do I just let go and be? It's a feminine quality. And because our society is is quite masculine um, focused, we have a lot of trouble with some of the more feminine qualities like surrender. Um, Attitude. So in meditation, in, in, whenever you, your mind wanders and you bring it back to the seed thought, to the breath, whatever it is, the mantra, you bring it back without judgment, without criticism. You bring it back, um, in, my, in my training, we were taught to bring it back with loving kindness. You come back to the, to the focus with loving kindness. So you're changing your attitude to what's going on in your own mind. You're developing this loving, kind relationship with yourself and with your own mind, with your unconscious and conscious mind. And that is a healing relationship. There's a patience in meditation. Anyone who's ever established a regular habit of meditation knows that it requires immense patience and perseverance and we, again, the loving kind, we don't expect a child, a one-year-old child, to just get up and walk. You know, they keep on, we, they keep on getting up and they keep on trying and we don't judge them or criticize them. We lovingly, kindly encourage them, knowing that it takes a while to develop a new skill. And we develop the same attitude with ourselves. So meditation is like training for mindfulness, And like anything, as you train um, regularly, you get better at it, okay? So, and this leads to being mindful in everyday life arises naturally. So a practice of meditation is like setting, setting, uh, it goes beautifully hand in hand with that practice of of mindfulness. I'm just going to quickly go through how to practice mindfulness. So the first thing is, See if you can meditate daily, Um, even if it's for 10 minutes, even if it's just sitting quietly, it's the regularity of it, Uh, it's the discipline, it's disciplining your lower mind. I describe to people, it's like our thoughts and our mind are like wild horses, incredibly powerful, running all over the place, and we just go where our thoughts take us, and it gets really busy and chaotic in there and really tiring. We're just following these wild horses. Meditation is like taming and harnessing those wild horses so that they go where you want them to. Still got their power, but you are in control, not the wild horses. Um, Recognize when you're caught up in fear, anxiety, overwhelm, stress, and negative thinking. And in that moment, connect with your breath and your senses till you feel that in this moment everything is fine. 
if you feel anxiety and fear, I teach people who have panic attacks, welling up, teach them to breathe down into your belly, connect with your breath until you feel fine. Or connect with the world. Watch a bird, connect with the trees, connect with the world around you and you'll notice because in the present moment, everything is always fine. There's no fear and doubt. There's no anxiety and worry. It doesn't exist in the present moment. Give your full attention to what you are doing. My kids go mad at me because when I send a text message, that's all I do. I don't talk to them as well. Mom, mom. No, I'm messaging. Oh, I'm, I'm giving my full attention to the message. Then I will give my full attention to them. And they just want me to do this double half and half thing where I'm, not, I'm doing this half-heartedly and I'm doing that half-heartedly and there's usually miscommunication somewhere along the line because we weren't present. Avoid multitasking. Okay. Connect with nature daily. Um, and gr this grounds your energy. It reminds you that we're part of nature, we're part of the planet, reminds us that we're here to spiritualize matter. When you walk mindfully on the earth, it's like you're kissing the earth with your feet. She loves it. You care about this planet, walk mindfully on her. Go and, go and swim in her oceans, go and connect with her trees in a mindful connection way. Be present to her beauty. Practice disciplines that bring you into connection with your body, like yoga, tai chi, qigong, walking meditation. These, when you are in connection, whenever you come into your body, you are mindful and present. Okay. Actively listen to others, to music, to relaxations, being fully present. Look into people's eyes when you're communicating with them. That's where their soul is. You can mindfully connect with their soul by looking into their eyes. Cultivate listening to your own body's language of aches and pains because your body talks to you through those aches and pains and mindfulness naturally leads to better physical body care. Eating mindfully. When you eat, and this, you'll lose weight if you eat mindfully. Much of the reason that we put on weight in our society is we don't take any notice when we're eating. So we just eat more of it because we want more of the flavor and we haven't actually uh, tasted it. And we wind up eating more than we need because we're not listening to our body saying, I've had enough now. Um, drink mindfully, drive mindfully, do habitual tasks with awareness, brush your teeth mindfully, wash up mindfully. Uh, when I was at the School of Practical Philosophy, we used to do hours of practicing, just make it like the Japanese tea ceremony, making a cup of tea mindfully. It's beautiful when you do that. It becomes a celebration and a ceremony. Choose to think mindfully. Use your mind as it was designed to be used. So use your mind as a tool to think. So if you have something you need to think about, just do that. Use your mind. Acknowledge when you see self-limiting beliefs, unconscious mind programs, self-sabotage programs of thoughts and behaviors. Acknowledge them. And you can seek to change these. You can go deep into meditation, tap into your intuition for greater understanding and insight. You can do stream of consciousness writing where your higher self will start to speak to you through journaling. There's things, I haven't got time to go into all of these now, there's something called emotional freedom tapping where you connect the conscious and unconscious mind and you can, with affirmations and tapping on meridian acupuncture points, you can reprogram the unconscious mind using affirmations. Um, there's a yoga posture, um, a krasan, that I'll probably teach, talk about in the session I do tomorrow on healing through the heart because it is fantastic for... Um, shifting unconscious um, patterns that you want to change. Choose to be content and happy through a gratitude practice. Might sound like new age, wishy-washy stuff, but when you consciously decide to be grateful and count your blessings, I'll talk about this tomorrow, you open your heart chakra. And when you do that, you, when you open your heart, you're present. 
Okay, because that's the other thing about mindfulness is you will lead a more open-hearted existence. Um, you can choose to be content. It's almost like fake it till you make it. If you decide you're going to be happy and content, you will be. Um, if before you go to sleep at night, you go through the things you're grateful for in that day, you'll go to sleep in an open-hearted energy. You will sleep better. You will wake up more positive. It just becomes a habit going, I'm doing it all the time. And the more you do it, the more you get to do it because it becomes your relationship with life. Okay. Learn to be more the feminine and do less the masculine. The yin, the yang. Um, and that's a whole nother topic. Um, so I'm going to leave that there because I've given you a lot. Um, but I really hope that you have a deeper understanding now of why I believe the cultivation of a practice of mindfulness is an essential spiritual practice for all those who truly seek greater conscious awareness and to live a spiritual life. Namaste. Namaste.